Th thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today, and thank you very much, Dimitri Papadimitriou, for all the great that you, work that you do. The Levy Institute is truly one of New York's great intellectual engines, and the topics that you've chosen for today's conference, stabilizing financial systems for growth and full employment, is very timely. The great debate over our financial system that followed the financial collapse in 2008 continues to rage here in Washington. In fact, we had a hearing on it yesterday and the day before, so it continues. In fact, later today, the House of Representatives will be voting on the Republican budget for the fiscal year 2015, written by Budget Committee Chairman and former Vice Presidential Candidate uh, Paul Ryan. This budget, known as the Ryan Budget, touches every part of our federal government, investments in education, research, infrastructure, defense, you name it, including financial regulation. Financial regulation is included in this budget. More than almost anything else, this budget per perfectly shows the stark uh, differences between the two parties, and especially on how they have evolved on financial issues. The main change that the Ryan budget calls for in financial regulation is the repeal of Title II in Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank, as you know, is the Wall Street reform legislation Congress passed in 2010 to strengthen our financial system and help prevent a, another collapse. And Title II is a central part of that reform because that is where we established the Orderly Liquidation Authority which gives the FDIC the authority to wind down large bank holding companies without damaging the broader markets. Remember that in 2008, when companies like Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, and AIG were on the verge of failing, regulators did not have the authority to deal with these companies the way the FDIC has long dealt with failed commercial banks because the FDIC's resolution powers only extended to commercial banks. But investment banks, insurance companies, or bank holding companies, Bear Stearns and Lehman were investment banks, and AIG was an insurance company. So the FDIC's well-established resolution powers, unfortunately, did not apply to any of them. This forced regulators to choose between a chaotic bankruptcy, which happened with Lehman, or a bailout, which happened with Bear Stearns and AIG. Neither was a good solution. Um, I can remember I was at a conference at Princeton, and at the beginning of the conference, I had something like 10 investment banks in my district. At the end of the weekend, there wasn't one left standing. It was an incredible uh, shock. Um, uh, Christina Romer testified before the Joint Economic Committee that the financial crisis of 2008 was five times stronger than the shocks in, in, the, in the Great Depression. After, after the AIG bailout, and, and to show how out of control it was, that no one understood what was happening, AIG appeared before our committee, the, bank, bank, the Financial Services Committee, and first testified that there was no need for a bailout. Then they came back and they needed 50 million. Then they came back and they needed 85 million. It ended up being roughly $189 million bailout, but the fact that they had no understanding of what the financial crisis was uh, shows uh, what a really mess our financial systems were in. And then afterwards, when we did bail out AIG, they then turned around and hired the man who created the crisis out of the out of the, uh, the, the bank in London that was their, their uh, risky products uh, division. It, AIG's insurance area had no problem whatsoever, but it was only in the risky, uh, risky um, investment banking area. They had to hire him to unwind it because no one else understood it. So <laughs> clearly a system that needed some change. After the AIG bailout, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Mr. Bernanke, and Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, came to Congress and asked for a $700 billion bailout for the entire banking industry. Facing an imminent and devastating collapse of the entire financial system, Congress passed the $700 billion bailout known as TARP, eventually. Uh, this was a very chaotic period. We, at one point, could not get the votes. The Democratic Party gave the re votes to a Republican president. 
I consider it one of the most important uh, votes that I ever cast and the most unpopular vote that I ever cast. Uh, the choice was, are you going to help stabilize the financial markets or let them collapse? To this day, it, it continues to be a controversial vote. Whatever the cause of the financial crisis, I can assure you that Congress did not want to be put in the position of voting on an immensely unpopular $700 billion bailout for Wall Street ever again. Title II of Dodd-Frank was Congress's response. The Orderly Liquidation Authority essentially extends the FDIC's long-standing resolution powers to large non-bank financial companies, such as bank holding companies, major insurers like AIG and Prudential, and large broker-dealers such as Bear Stearns and Lehman, if they were still around. The idea of a new FDIC-like resolution authority for, far, for large financial institutions was popular at that time among both Republicans and Democrats. Senator Bob Corker, who is hardly a bleeding heart liberal, worked very hard on Title II during the Dodd-Frank debate, precisely because he believed so strongly in it. Two of the biggest proponents of Title II were then FDIC chairwoman Sheila Baer and then Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, both Republicans, and not to mention two people who I might add didn't always see eye to eye on these kinds of issues. So it's surprising, and I would say disappointing, that the Republican Party has turned so heavily against Title II, which represents our best chance of avoiding another TARP-style bailout. In discussing Title II, the Ryan budget calls for, and I quote, ending this regime now, enshrining into law, which paves the way for future bailouts, end quote. How exactly does Title II's orderly liquidation authority, quote, pave the way for future bailouts? According to the Republicans on the Financial Services Committee on which I serve, it's because Title II, quote, grants the FDIC the authority to borrow from the Treasury in resolving a failed financial institution, end quote. Now, back in 2009, when the Financial Services Committee was crafting Dodd-Frank, the Republicans were singing a different tune. The Democrats on the committee, myself included, wanted to avoid the need for the FDIC to borrow from Treasury by creating an upfront resolution fund paid for through assessments on, on our largest banks, which, it, which would have been roughly $150 billion. We thought that that was the best way to avoid using taxpayer funds to resolve a large financial institution. Um, because the FDIC would have access to $150 billion to use for what the bankruptcy called debtor in possession financing. That is financing to keep the bankrupt company open during uh, the wind down. This financing is critical because it ensures that the wind down of a company can take place in an orderly fashion that does not inject major damage on the broader uh, financial markets. When we proposed this common sense solution, the Republicans on the committee immediately denounced it as a permanent bailout fund, end quote. Given the fierce opposition to anything that was labeled, quote, a bailout, back in 2009 and 10, the Republicans ultimately and unfortunately succeeded in stripping out their, quote, permanent bailout fund. But the FDIC was still in charge of winding down large financial institutions, which meant that it still had to get, quote, debtor in possession, quote, financing from somewhere. Without an industry financed re resolution, fund to tap, of course, the only other guaranteed source of financing in a crisis was, you guessed it, the Treasury Department. So that's what we did. We gave the FDIC the authority to borrow from Treasury to fund the resolution fund. One way or another, however, we were determined to make the industry and not taxpayers <coughs> pay for this. So we required the FDIC <coughs> to recoup any and all money that it borrows from Treasury from the industry, though after the fact, through after the fact assessments. Thank you so much. It wasn't a, a, a perfect solution by any means, but it did at least ensure that in the long run, the taxpayers would always be made whole and large banks would have to pay the entire cost of the resolution uh, of authority. 
It was sadly all the taxpayer protection that the Republicans would allow us to provide. So the fact that House Republicans are saying that Title II, quote, paves the way for future bailouts because it allows the FDIC to borrow from Treasury is especially ironic. Given that it was the Republicans who forced us to abandon the only thing that would have avoided the need for the FDIC to borrow from Treasury in the first place, the upfront industry financed resolution fund. Unfortunately, this represents the worst of what has become known as, quote, bailout politics. This is the swift knife of political attacks. It's a brutally effective, endlessly uh, versatile attack that can be used in practically any context. If you oppose a government program, any government program, really the best way to kill it is to label it, quote, a bailout. It's the final triumph of an attack ad over rational policy. And it has stifled the debate over practically all meaningful financial reforms. Re the reason that I'm highlighting this issue today is because the topic of this conference is stabilizing financial systems. And in my opinion, repealing Title II of Dodd-Frank is the most destabilizing thing that Congress could do to the financial markets. And secondly, I'm financing it because it's, it is a, a prime target of the Republican Party. It's even included in the budget bill we'll be voting on today and has been the subject, I would say, of at least 10 hearings before the Financial Services Committee, or many, many hearings. I shouldn't put a number on it. Now, some people might say that the Ryan budget is just a partisan document and we shouldn't worry about any efforts to repeal Title II. But just remember that the Ryan budget essentially sets out the Republican Party's platform on the entire range of issues, and repealing Title II is one of the only financial reforms that the Ryan budget calls for. So if the Republicans win the Senate this year and then win the presidency in 2016, this might be one of the very first financial issues that they take up. And, and this uh, scares me, quite frankly. And I believe it should scare anyone who cares about financial stability. The other main financial reform issue that the Ryan budget addresses is housing finance reform. <clears throat> Nowhere has the debate been stifled by, quote, bailout politics more than housing finance reform, unfortunately. And uh, a testimony before the Joint S Economics Committee and, and the Financial Services Committee, <clears throat> many economists rate housing as 20, 25% of our economy with their related industries and, and, and uh, supportive uh, uh, businesses that support it. So until we get the GSE uh, problem resolved so that there is uh, stability or investors know the future, uh, I feel this is going to hold back investment. Housing has been one of the slowest areas to return, and it's one of the things that I believe is keeping our, our financial uh, recovery from uh, going forward. Not surprisingly, the Ryan budget calls for, quote, putting an end to taxpayer bailouts and housing finance. A, a typically subtle and nuanced position. In GSE reform, however, the Republicans' desire to use bailout politics has led them to endorse a proposal known <coughs> as the PATH Act, which completely privatizes the secondary market for mortgages, the mortgage market, removing the government guarantee that experts on both sides of the aisle agree is necessary. <coughs> I do not know of any uh, stakeholder in the industry or otherwise that supports the PATH Act. Without a government guarantee, middle class families would no longer have access to the 30 year fixed rate mortgage, which has long been the cornerstone of the US mortgage market. And I would say it's the cornerstone of the American dream for American families to own their own home and to make that affordable. But the government guarantee is important more than just for the single family housing market. It is equally important for the multi-family housing market as well. Without a, a government backstop, rents for middle and lower income families would skyrocket, reducing the amount of disposable income that they otherwise would spend productively and, and ultimately, <coughs> quote, harm our, our economic growth. 
The reason that I choose, uh, chose to focus on multifamily housing and GSE reform is that in my district in New York City, <coughs> multifamily housing is our single family housing. Multifamily housing is also the missing piece of the puzzle in GSE reform. Corker Warner and the PATH Act ignored it entirely, even though one third of all Americans live in rental homes. <coughs> That's why I'm focusing on to make sure that multifamily housing is not neglected or harmed in this process. Fannie and Freddie's multifamily businesses were not the source of the problem. <coughs> in fact, they propped up the single family businesses during the crisis. The multifamily businesses didn't suffer any losses during the crisis, which allowed them <coughs> to play a critical counter-cyclical role. They stepped in to provide liquidity, just as private investors were fleeing. Most importantly, the multifamily businesses already require the private sector to take substantial losses before the taxpayer which is exactly what we're trying to get the single family businesses to do in GSE reform. Recognizing this, I believe that the successful formula for multifamily housing finance reform must first maintain an explicit government guarantee while also ensuring that taxpayers are protected by preserving and building on the GSE's successful risk sharing programs with the private sector. <coughs> Thirdly, ensuring that the multifamily market <coughs> continues to function, continues to function in downturns. With over 17 million households living in multifamily housing, it's important that we get this right. As someone who served on the Financial Services Committee and who represents the capital of U.S. financial markets, I know and I've seen how essential uh, functioning and stable financial systems are to our economy. That's why I'm so passionate about ensuring that Congress doesn't roll back the essential reforms we passed just a few years ago. And it's why I'm knee deep in the debate on, on housing finance reform, to make sure we don't pull the rug out from homeowners and needlessly set back an enormous sector of our economy. As I said at the beginning, the debate in Washington, D.C. on the future of our financial systems is raging, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. That's why these conferences are so important, and it's why the work that you are all doing is important. We rely on your analysis and assessments, and we have your opinion, and we take your opinions seriously. And in fact, I see several people who have testified before the Financial Services Committee here today. Uh, so I look forward to having a chance to, to work with some of you as Congress moves forward with these debates. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak.